today is a different kind of a message. It's kind of an in-between message that we do in between series. And um, I chose a topic that's not talked too much, talked about too much anymore in churches today. I've called the message, How Will the World End? How Will the World End? And last weekend when I announced this message, I think my daughter sensed a little apprehension in my voice because I said, I'm going to preach the, the, the truth that's not preached too much anymore in our day and age, and, uh, but I'm going to go ahead and do it next weekend, so I want you all to be here. And she sensed some hesitancy in my voice, and so I think that she was at school, and I got this text on, um, on uh, I think, Wednesday morning. She said, I want to hear some violins and some oohs and ahs on this, okay? I just want to say that I'm so proud to have you as my father. All right. You have such a heart for ministry and for people. Okay. I'm looking forward all week. It's shameless, I know. I'm looking forward all week to your sermon this weekend. I was, okay, enough awes. All right, Dad. I was reading some verses on the end times, and you mentioned on Sunday that you don't want to stand before God without sharing the prophecy of the end time scriptures. I saw this verse in Revelation 1 and verse 3. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of the prophecy. And blessed are those who hear the words written in it, for the time is near. Wow, that's pretty deep from a 16-year-old. She said, don't forget to remind the people, in so many words, that they are going to be so blessed just to hear these words, according to the Bible. And I'm going to be so blessed to share the words. Isn't that awesome? So we're all going to be blessed today by studying the end time scriptures. And this is going to be a very encouraging message. And I hope you'll receive it in that way. When I was a little boy, we would commonly sing a song in church that went this way. Signs of the time are everywhere. There's a brand new feeling in the air. Keep your eyes upon the eastern sky. Lift up your head. Your redemption draws nigh. And I want to tell you, friends, never has that song been more truer than it is today. Allow me to mention just a few signs of the second coming of Jesus Christ that have already been fulfilled. In fact, there is not one sign left to be fulfilled. They've all been fulfilled, meaning Jesus could come back at any time. First of all, the Bible says before Jesus returns, the people of Israel who have been scattered all around the world for thousands of years will have to return to their homeland in the Middle East. And they will have to become a nation. Do you know that that never happened until 1948 when the people of Israel returned to the Middle East and they actually became a nation? That sign has been fulfilled. It's amazing. The Bible says that before Jesus Christ returns in the second coming, that the ancient Roman Empire will have to be revived. And the ancient Roman Empire was huge. It, it occupied all of, you know, most of the Middle East and, and uh, almost all of Europe at the time. And people wondered, how could this ever be fulfilled? How could the ancient Roman Empire come back into being once again? Until the 1950s and 1960s, when the European coalition began to be established. And today, when you travel through Europe, you know that they have one monetary system called the euro, which all the European uh, countries now are basically operating off of. Also, when you travel through Europe, it used to be you had to stop at uh, Hungary and, you know, and, uh, and, and Britain and all these companies and show your passport. Not today. They've all become one. You can travel right through all those nations and cross those lines. You know why? Because they've all come together in a coalition, and that coalition is, is making up that old, ancient Roman Empire. It's amazing what we're seeing right before our eyes. The Bible says, in the last days before Jesus Christ returns, the entire world's focus will return to the Middle East. And people wondered, how in the world will people's focus return to the Middle East? This is about 100 years ago, until one three-letter word was discovered, oil. And today, all the eyes of the world are on the energy source of our world, which is the Middle East. The eyes of the world have returned to the Middle East. Jesus himself predicted these words in Matthew 24, 6. He said, in that day you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. 
And there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these things will happen before the return of Jesus Christ. Now, here's the good news. How many of you are ready for some really good news off the bat here today? Just before all hell breaks loose on planet Earth, the Bible says the rapture of the church is going to take place, and as many as 50 million born-again Christians in America alone are going to be raptured out of this place. They're going to disappear in the twinkling of an eye. Add to that hundreds of millions worldwide will be raptured up or taken up out of this world. And friends, when that event happens, it'll set the stage for a new world leader to arise who will somehow be able to negotiate peace in the Middle East. Now, some of you are hearing this and you're saying, Luke, how could one man rule the world? How could one man rule this world? I used to wonder that myself. But you know, today through technologies such as Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, the global media, our world has come together in a kind of global closeness like never before. We feel much more in touch with all the other citizens of our world. And it's conceivable that our world could literally come together through these different mediums and cry out for world peace and uh, the need for oil and water and food. And the nations of our world could clamor for one man who had the answer, the answer for peace. Bring it all together and make our world work. It's the cry of our world right now. Can somebody just bring peace to our world? The Bible refers to this coming world leader as the Antichrist. How many of you have heard the name the Antichrist? Uh, this word suggests, the title suggests, he will be against Christ or instead of Christ. He will be anti-Jesus Christ and he will try to convince the world that he is indeed the Christ. He will be Satan's superman who tortures, persecutes, and kills the people of God. He will be the most powerful dictator that this world has ever known. And ultimately, he will lead all the nations, all the armies of all the nations of our world into that final battle, the Battle of Armageddon. Now, he's not mentioned often by the name Antichrist in the Bible, only four times, all in the book of John. But he has many aliases. He's been known as the prince that shall come, the fierce king, the despicable man, the man of destruction, the man of lawlessness, and of course, the most famous title, the beast. Well, Luke, who is the Antichrist? Can you tell us who he is? Now, don't get nervous. I'm not going to make any predictions here today. Although, over the years, it's been a famous hobby among Christian leaders to try to identify who the Antichrist really is. For an example, in the late 1930s and 40s, when Hitler was in power in Germany, many believed that the Antichrist was Hitler. And so some overzealous end-time junkies came up with a little formula. They said, identified Hitler as the Antichrist. Now, in order to understand how their little formula worked, you have to read Revelation 13, verses 16 through 18. At the end of that passage, it says, he's known as the Antichrist. He, 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 um, he has the mark of the name of the beast, and his number will be what? 666. Six, six. How many have ever heard the number 666 six, six before? Okay? Now, if you have that number in your home address or your cell phone or your social security number, I would change it right away. It's not a good thing, all right? Not a good thing. Uh, but here's how these folks calculated uh, that Hitler was the Antichrist. They said, really, all you have to do if you want to prove that Hitler is the Antichrist is numeralize the alphabet. And so 100 is A, and 101 is B, and 102 is C, and so on through the alphabet. So if you take Hitler's name, H is 107, and 108 is I, and T is 119, and L is 111, and E is 104, and R is 117, and you add all those up, the number equals 666. So obviously, Hitler must be the Antichrist. Now, isn't this a lot of fun, you know? Uh, with that kind of thing, you can make anyone you want the Antichrist. Others predicted that John F. Kennedy was the Antichrist. Because believe it or not, at his presidential convention in 1956, he received 666 votes. And so people said, well, he must be the Antichrist. He was also, catch this, shot through the head, which is what the Bible says will happen to the Antichrist at some point. He'll take a blow to his head and he'll die and he'll come back to life. He'll be raised from the dead 
and people will see that, and they'll begin to worship him. And so many thought that when GFK was shot in the head, he would actually stand up and be revived, and people would worship him, which, of course, uh, they did not. So the Bible doesn't tell us who the Antichrist is. In fact, <laughs> 2 Thessalonians says that the Antichrist will not be revealed until after the rapture. So if you find yourself in a place where you know who the Antichrist is, it's not a good thing. It means you've been left behind, all right? <laughs> so although it's not possible for us to know who the Antichrist will be, it's possible to know what kind of man he will be. Let's talk about the personality of the Antichrist. The Bible says he's going to be a charismatic leader. Now, that does not mean he's going to be a Pentecostal. I don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, a charismatic leader, Gen Daniel 7 and verse 8. And there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking pompous words, verse 20, which had eyes and a mouth that spoke pompous words. Verse 25, he shall speak pompous words against the Most High God. One of the characteristics of this coming world ruler will be his charismatic personality. He will easily be able to sway the masses by his speaking ability and his charm. And the Bible says he will continue to speak pompous words against the Most High God. Uh, the Apostle John describes him in a similar fashion, Revelation 13. He was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. He will be known for his eloquence and he will capture the attention of the people of our world. He will be called special, the chosen one among the people. And he will be welcomed by the masses. Now, some of you are looking at me right now and saying, Look, you're crazy. How, how could this possibly happen? How could one man rule the world or deceive that many people? Can a nation be deceived? Well, in Charles Colson's book, Kingdom and Conflict, Kingdoms in Conflict, he describes the well orchestrated events that were played out in countless halls as Hitler manipulated and deceived the German people. This is what he writes. Solemn symphonic music began the setup. The music then stopped. A hush prevailed and a patriotic anthem began. From the back, walked slowly down the wide center aisle, strutted Hitler. Finally, the Fuhrer himself rises to speak, beginning in a low velvet voice, which makes the audience unconsciously lean forward to hear. He begins to speak of his love for Germany. Gradually, his pitch increases until he reaches a screaming crescendo, but his audience doesn't mind because they're already standing to their feet and streaming with him. Friends, this is how it'll be when the Antichrist comes into power. He will be able to rally the people of our world behind him because of his charisma and his charm and his speaking ability. And then Daniel 7 also describes him as one whose appearance will be greater than his fellows. Not only will he move people by his words, but he will have a strikingly attractive appearance. And through this electric personality and through his strikingly good looks, he'll be able to manipulate the entire world. And the Bible says they'll follow him. Do you know why? Because they'll be so hungry for an answer. They just want peace. They just want a leader to stand up who can provide the answers. He'll be a charismatic leader. Second, he'll be a cunning leader. Daniel 7, 8 says, I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. Now, these three horns are referring to three kings. This future world leader, the Antichrist, will rise up and he will assassinate or take out three other rulers, perhaps by assassination. And then he will take over their kingdoms until his influence spreads throughout the Western world. This is what the Bible says. Daniel describes his rise to power this way, Daniel 11. He shall come in peaceably. Everybody will want him. And he will seize the kingdom by intrigue. He'll be a cunning leader but he'll also be a cultic leader. Paul the Apostle describes him this way in 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 4, who opposes and exalts himself. He's cultic above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Can you imagine this kind of creature? 
The kind of creature who would exalt himself and demand that people worship him as God, even though he is the creature. And according to the Bible, here's what's amazing, the people will do it. The people will actually worship him. Revelation 13, 8, all who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Friends, he will be a a charismatic leader. He'll be a cunning leader. He'll be a cultic leader. But number four, listen carefully, he'll also be a cruel leader. This world will never know this kind of cruelty until he ultimately arrives. Once he gains power, he will begin to demonstrate the cruelty of his heart. Daniel 7, listen to this. The fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all other kingdoms. And he shall devour the earth. He shall trample it and break it into pieces. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High God. He shall persecute the saints of the Most High God. Listen, friends, the Bible says when this future world leader comes on the scene, he will devour the world. He will trample it. He will break it into pieces. He will persecute the saints. And although those of us who know Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, we're not going to be here. We're going to be raptured up before all this takes place. But the Bible says that many people will come to know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior during the tribulation period. And the Bible says that he will take out his wrath on these Christians. He will persecute them and beat them down. You see, according to the Bible, there's going to be a lot of people saved during the tribulation period because there's going to be a massive uh, evangelistic surge happening on planet earth and many Christians will be saved and then give up their lives they'll be martyred for their faith now that phrase persecute the saints literally means to wear out it is describing a kind of slow and painful wearing down of the people of God to the point where it would be better for them for the antichrist to just kill them than to let them live in all the misery and torture they're experiencing but he won't kill them he will just wear out their souls. He'll wear them out day after day after day. He'll be a cruel, cruel leader. Charles Colson describes this type of thing with Hitler's regime. This is what he says. The first Nazi concentration camp opened in 1933. In one camp, hundreds of Jewish prisoners survived in disease-infested barracks on little food and gruesome back-breaking work. Each day, the prisoners were marched to the compound's giant factory where tons of human waste and garbage were distilled into alcohol to be used as a fuel additive. And even worse than this nauseating smell was the realization that they were fueling the Nazi war regime, which had killed their family members and was killing their friends. As a result of the humiliation and drudgery of their lives, dozens of prisoners went mad and ran from their work only to be shot by the guards or to be electrocuted by the fences. You see, Hitler was so cruel, he didn't just exterminate the Jews. He systematically and deliberately wore out their, their souls. And this is the way it will be when the Antichrist comes into power. He will be a cruel, bloodshedding blood leader, taking out his wrath on the Christians who were still on this earth. So that's a look at his personality but now what about the profile, the profile of the Antichrist? What about his profile politically? Where, how will he come into power? The Bible says he'll come into power, catch this, inconspicuously. The Bible says he won't bolt to power one day and say, I'm the Antichrist, I'm the one you've all been looking for. He will sort of squeeze himself slowly into the spotlight. The Apostle John tells us that he will arise from the masses of people. Revelation 13 and verse 1. Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his head a blasphemous name. Now the sea here represents the masses of the people of the earth. You've all heard that line, the sea of humanity. It's, it came actually from this New Testament passage. Again, in Revelation 17, 15, it says, Then he said to me, The waters which you saw, that's the sea, where the harlot sits are the peoples, multitudes, and nations, and tongues. So John says, look, he's going to rise up very slowly out of the masses of people. It's not going to happen overnight. He would just sort of squeeze himself into the spotlight. Second question, what about his national profile? What nation will he arise out of? 
Now, the Bible isn't clear about this, but one thing is clear. He does not have to be a Jew. Many end-time uh, professors for years thought that he would have to be a Jew in order to make a treaty with the Jewish people uh, because the Bible says a treaty will take place. But, you know, if you know the charisma and the charm of this man, you know, his persona is he can make a deal with anybody, even the Jews, right? So he will be able to make a, a, a treaty with the Jews. What about his spiritual profile? What will he look like spiritually? Revelation 11:7 7 says, when they finish their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against him. Does that tell you a little bit about him spiritually? Where does he come from? Hell. He comes from the bottomless pit, pit, the place that God created for Satan and all of his angels. Okay? Are you all still with me out there? I want you all to take a deep breath right now. That's a lot of bad news. But now I want to share some good news with you. Let me share about his providential profile. How much power will he actually have? Revelation 13 and verse 5. I love this verse. He was given a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies. And he was given authority to continue for 42 months and was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. Question, who gave him this authority? God Almighty. God Almighty is not surprised by this. In fact, the reality is the Antichrist is on a leash. And at the end, other end of that leash is Almighty God himself. Can you say amen to that? God's not surprised by this. God's not worried about this. God hasn't woken up one day and said, oh, no, the Antichrist. He's being unleashed on planet Earth. Everything he does, as evil as he is, is within the confines and the parameters of Almighty God. God doesn't empower him or give him power to do it. God simply uh, allows him to do it. He gives him permission to do it. Sort of like when Satan wanted to test Job. Remember that? Satan had to come to God and ask for permission before he touched Job. Otherwise, he couldn't touch him. It was all within God's parameters. And I tell you this because, you know, as you look around at the world today... And you read these scriptures and these prophecies and you look at the, the headlines on the news and you read the newspapers and go online and look at the news online. It can be pretty depressing. <laughs> and you can, you know, say, man, the, the world's gone mad. You know, and where's God in all this? And there's no hope and God's fallen asleep and all these kinds of things. But friends, never, ever forget this. God is still in control. And the Antichrist, as evil as he is, will always be at the other end of that leash that God is holding. So we have talked about his personality and his profile. And then last, what about his program? What's the program of the Antichrist? What is he going to actually do when he comes into power? Let me give you the highlights of his program. Listen to this verse, Revelation 13. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, that's Satan, his throne and great authority. And I saw one of the heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. And then all the world marveled, and they followed the beast. Here's the timeline of what is going to happen. Listen very carefully. The Bible says the trumpet of the Lord is going to sound. All those who have given their life to Jesus Christ, they made them him their savior. They're living their life for the glory of God. They've been washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. We're going to be raptured up in a moment to be with the Lord. At that moment, our world will cry out for a leader who can make peace in the Middle East. And this hellish leader is going to rise up onto the scene. By the way, right now in our world, let me tell you how close this is. Peace in the Middle East is so critical to us right now. Do you know why? Because 60% of the world's oil reserves are right there in that area. And if someone doesn't solve that problem quick, the whole world as we know it today can be shut down overnight. That's why we fought the Gulf War. You know that, right? Because it's so important to us. The Bible says that the Middle East will continue to be a place of unrest until this charismatic leader comes on the scene. And he's going to say stuff like this. He's going to say, I have the answer. 
I have the answer to peace in the Middle East. And he will make a covenant with Israel on behalf of all the nations of the world. And for three and a half years, there's going to be peace on planet Earth. And people will lift this leader up and say, he's great. He's almost like a god. He's provided peace in the Middle East. But halfway through the tribulation, three and a half years, his peaceful tactics will turn to punishing tactics. And he will break that covenant with Israel and he will subject the Jewish people to their worst season of persecution in their long history of suffering. Immediately after that, the Bible says the Antichrist is going to be killed, okay? Can you imagine that day that this guy who's brought peace to the world, he's the savior of the world, he's going to be killed. The Bible says uh, a blow to his head, I believe he was shot in the head. And everybody thinks he's dead, but Satan, through his power, in a counterfeit resurrection of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, brings him back to life, convincing the people of the world that he is indeed the one to be followed and worshipped. Wow. Can you imagine what that moment's going to be like in the soon coming days? When JFK was shot, people marched on his casket for days, Days, days. Can you imagine if while they were marching around his casket, all of a sudden he stood up and began to speak? Do you think that would maybe get the attention of our world if he did something like that? The Bible says a similar thing is going to happen with the Antichrist. He will be mortally wounded and then resurrected. And after he is resurrected, he will control the, he will control the Western empires and set himself up to be worshipped all throughout this world. He will then require all the people on planet Earth to take his mark, which is known as the mark of the beast. Now listen carefully. I think sometimes we think about this as being so far out, but you know it's kind of happening all around us right now. A huge problem that's emerged over the past 15 years is something called identity theft. How many in this place have ever had your identity stolen? Raise your hand real high. Yeah, it's a big, big problem. And uh, it's forcing the powers of our, of our world now to think about new solutions so that we can retain our identity while at the still uh, same time uh, not have it stolen from us, you know? So they're, one, of the, one of the ideas that they're introducing is some kind of magnetic chip that goes in the body somewhere so that it can't be stolen from us and it will still retain our identity. Now, you say, well, why is this so important? I, I saw a commercial online this past week of a, of a, of a, a new system that they're advertising of a chip they can put in a person's hand right here so that if you're in an accident on the freeway and the ambulance shows up and you don't have your ID, they can scan that chip and bring up your whole history of your family right there on the spot. It already exists, this technology. It's already happening in cats and dogs. In fact, when I go into Starbucks now, um, I don't even use cash anymore. I go into Starbucks now, I just have them scan a little barcode in my right hand, the thing I put up to my forehead, my right hand on my forehead. Pretty, pretty amazing how these things work, isn't it? It's a beautiful thing. I mean, it's a bad thing. It's a bad thing. I want you to know. No. Um, but uh, we can just kind of get numb to it and play right into it. Now, why is this so important? Scripture says that the Antichrist will be able to control the whole world economy because everyone will be in this gigantic database. It's like we're reading the headlines right now, isn't it? And there won't be any need for cash because there will only be one employer of the world. It'll be the government and it'll be the Antichrist. And there won't be any need for any cash. And, you know, uh, the only way you'll be able to access the funds that the government puts into your account is if you had this mark of the beast. And if you have the mark of the beast, you can't function in life. You can't buy. You can't sell. You can't own a business. You'll be on the run. And then in his final act of rebellion, this vile world leader will set himself up in Jerusalem to be worshipped. He will desecrate the temple of the Jews in what is called the abomination of desolation. And he will attempt to annihilate every single Jew on the face of the earth. Listen carefully. He will be able at that time to ga galvanize and gather all the armies of all the world. And the Bible says in the last days they will converge in and surround the little nation of Israel. And the Bible says there will be an army of 200 million soldiers coming from the east. 
Who ever heard of something like that? 200 million soldiers. Who could possibly, you know, arm an army or man an army of 200 million soldiers? Well, it just so happens that, that China is located just to the east there. And there in that moment, it'll be that final ultimate battle called the Battle of Armageddon. The final ultimate battle. When all those nations come against is little Israel. Now listen carefully. Enter King Jesus. The Bible says he's riding on a white horse, leading the armies from heaven. Who are these armies? That's you and me who have been raptured up to be with the Lord and all the other saints and angels. We're coming down with Jesus. And the Bible says that we're actually going to be wearing white. That's kind of cocky, don't you think? Going into a battle wearing white. You know, battles are messy. Where's our fatigues, right? But you see, we're not going to lift a finger in this battle. The Bible says that we're going to be there just to praise God and just admire God as he executes judgment in that battle. Revelation 19 says, it just reminds us that this is going to be a war like no other war. It'll be very short in duration. Just a few words. God's going to speak and the whole thing is going to be over with in a moment. And the way this prophecy describes war is to describe the aftermath of the war. This is what it says. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun. And he cried with a loud voice saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of the heaven. Speaking to the birds now. Come and gather together for the supper of the great God. That you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, and of those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great. And all the birds were filled with their flesh. Friends, look at me. John sees a vision that is too awful for words. He sees the fowls of the heavens come into this battleground called Armageddon. The word fowls is interpreted vultures. After the Lord executes judgment at the battle of Armageddon, there will be such utter destruction of humanity that all the vultures on the planet will be, will be gathered together for what the Bible calls the great supper of God. Now listen, actually in, in Revelation 19, there's two great suppers mentioned. Two great suppers. In the early part of the chapter, it talks about the marriage supper of the Lamb. Oh, man, what a celebration that is going to be. That's the celebration of the wedding between Jesus Christ and his church. You, Jesus Christ and his bride. And, man, I, I don't know about you, but I've already made my reservation for that supper. Amen? I'm going to be there on that day. What a celebration it's going to be. It's going to be awesome. But I want to tell you, if you have to choose between one of these two suppers in Revelation 19, I would suggest you choose the marriage supper of the Lamb because there there's going to be great singing and rejoicing and fellowship and a great meal. But in the great supper of God, you are the meal. So you don't want to be there when God executes his judgment on that day. Listen carefully. On that day, the Antichrist will be defeated. The Jewish nation will be spared. The kingdom of God is going to be set up in place to rule on this earth for 1,000 years. And King Jesus will rule and reign in peace on this earth. The Bible says the lion will lay down with the lamb. All the implements of war will be beaten to plowshares and men will study war no more. You say, well, Luke, how does the world end? That's the title today. How does the world end? Friends, I've read the last chapter of the book and in the end, we win. The Bible says we win in the end. Don't be discouraged. Don't be dismayed. We win in the end. Amen. Well, I can get fired up about this. Luke, that's a fascinating story. What have you been smoking this week, man? I didn't write it, but I believe it. You see, when you become a true follower of Jesus Christ, his power begins to be operational in your life, and you begin to see that his word is true in all the areas of your life. And therefore, when there are things in the Bible that you don't quite understand how they work, you still believe them because you're not God. You know? You're finite. God is infinite. And so 
You have to believe some things in the Bible even though you don't understand all about, uh, all about them. You know what I'm talking about? We have to do this in life. Well, Luke, I just don't believe it. I, I just don't believe what you said. Just because you say you don't believe it does not mean that it's any less true. Well, that's just not my doctrine. It's God's doctrine, you know? And the Bible says that day is quickly approaching. Let me tell you how true it is. Right now, somewhere on this planet, perhaps, there's a young man growing into maturity. He's probably a contemplative young man. And in his, inside his heart is this hellish rage that boils like a cauldron of molten steel. He hates God. He hates Jesus. He despises the church. And in his mind are dreams of conquest. And once he is in power, he will unleash hell on this earth. Really, Luke, can our world produce such a person? Really? Well, Hitler was once a boy. Nero was once a boy. Stalin was once a lad the unthinkable things that the members of ISIS are doing right now. They were once little babies. This young man could be alive right now, being molded and shaped by Satan himself into the terrorist that I've been describing to you today. Well, Luke, that's frightening stuff. Uh, it's pretty scary stuff. But friends, I don't want you to be frightened today for two reasons. Here's the first reason. First of all, I'm going to say it again. We're not going to be around to witness any of these things. These things happen seven years. We'll be in heaven seven years prior to these things happening. Can you say amen to that? That's good news to rejoice today. And secondly, don't spend your time. Don't waste your time looking for the Antichrist. Spend your time looking for the Christ. Can you say amen to that? And the two are easy to differentiate. Let me give you the ABCs of the real Christ as opposed to the false Christ, the Antichrist. A, we abhor the Antichrist, we adore Christ. B, we blame the Antichrist, we believe in Christ. C, we curse the Antichrist, we confess the Christ. D, we despise the Antichrist, we desire Christ. E, we explain the Antichrist, we extol Christ. F, we fear the Antichrist, but we fellowship with Christ. G, we glare at the Antichrist, but we gaze at Christ. H, we hate the Antichrist, but we hail Christ. I, we investigate the Antichrist, but we insist on Christ. J, we judge the Antichrist, we're judged by Christ. K, we know about the Antichrist, but we know Christ. Amen. L, we loathe the Antichrist, but we love Christ. M, we minimize the Antichrist, we maximize Jesus Christ. And we nullify the Antichrist, but we need Christ. O, we oppose the Antichrist, but we obey Christ. P, we put down the Antichrist, but we praise Christ. Christ. Q, we question the Antichrist, but we quote Jesus Christ. R, we reject the Antichrist, but we revere Christ. S, we survey the Antichrist, but we serve Christ. T, we test the Antichrist, but we trust Christ. U, we unmask the, un the Antichrist, but we uplift Christ. V, we vilify the Antichrist, but we verify the Christ. W, we warn against the Antichrist, but we worship the Christ. X. Y, we yawn at the Antichrist, but we yearn for Christ. Z, we zone out the Antichrist, but we zero in on Jesus Christ. Friends, that's our model. That's how we live our lives. Listen, friends, all the prophecies in the Bible are about Jesus Christ. It's about Jesus. In fact, the opening words of the book of Revelation say, the revelation of who? Jesus Christ. The book is about Jesus Christ, not the Antichrist. The Antichrist is incidental, small potatoes, because he's going to be defeated. And the Bible says, ultimately, 
that Jesus Christ will take authority. He will be crowned King of Kings and Lord of Lords and every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Every knee is going to bow. Well, I know some of my friends, they'll never bow. They'll bow. They'll bow. Well, I know some people, they'll never bow to Jesus Christ. They'll all bow. Trust me, they will bow. And the old Fram oil filter commercial says, you can pay me now or you can pay me later. When it comes to bowing before Christ, you can bow willingly before him today while he speaks in love and mercy and compassion. While he says, just come to me, acknowledge who I am, acknowledge what I've done, ask me to be the Lord of your life, ask me to forgive your sins, I want to forgive you. Or one day you will bow unwillingly before him, knowing that you have the opportunity, but you said no, and by that time it'll be too late. It'll be too late. Now's the time to bow. Now's the time to make Jesus your Savior. Thanks for joining us today. You know, a lot of people have questions about faith, questions about God, and questions about how to be connected to God, how to be in right relationship with God. Well, it's really as simple as the ABCs of the gospel. A stands for acknowledge. There comes a time in life when we have to acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. Acknowledge that we have sinned and that there's a sin barrier that separates us from God. And then B, believe that Jesus Christ is who he said he was, that he is the sacrificial lamb of the world, the one who went to the cross and died for us to forgive our sins. And then C, C stands for confession. It's confessing that we have sinned and that we need God's help. And the only way to get to God is through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. If you can acknowledge your need for God today, and if you can believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is the Savior, and if you can confess that you need Him in your life and that you want to follow Him, the Bible says that you can be saved. So would you say this prayer with me right now? Would you just say, Dear Heavenly Father, I give you my life. Today I acknowledge that I need your help. And Lord, I believe that Jesus Christ is God's Son and that He died for me on the cross and that His payment on the cross was made to forgive my sins. And Lord, I confess that to you today. I choose to follow Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I choose Jesus and I won't turn back. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer today, the Bible says that your sins have been forgiven and you're starting a whole new adventure with God, you and God together, and it's going to be exciting. God bless you.